those words from the Old Testament. They may be new to you, but I know them well. Those are my ancestors. My roots go back a long way. I should introduce myself. I've been asked to tell you about the week that changed our lives, mine and Malika's. My name is Kim, and I'm the innkeeper. Ha! Huh. Not that I had a choice in the matter. The property has been in our family for a thousand years. It was a gift to my great, great, great grandfather, Kimham, from the famous King David, as a way of saying thank you for his help during Absalom's uprising. It was a valuable piece of property, and Kimham made the most of it. It was located on the route south toward Egypt. So Kimham built a sort of a motel. Oh, it was no Hyatt Regency. It wasn't even a Holiday Inn. It was more of a caravansary, a stopover for caravans with huge, thick stone walls. You and your servants could be safe from robbers and beasts, and you could get a good night's rest. But that was just the beginning. Ever since then, the property has been given to the oldest son, passed on. And each one would make a few changes here, a few changes there, always fixing it up just to make it a little bit better. And by the time of the days of Jeremiah the prophet, Kim Ham's lodge was no secret. It was the finest inn in Bethlehem. In fact, it was the only inn in Bethlehem. But that's no small accomplishment. You see, in those years, we were overrun by the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Ptolemies, the Parthians. And now, the Romans. I hate the Romans. It's a miracle the lodge still stands. But you know what they say. Everyone needs a good night's sleep. So the lodge went on and eventually was passed down to me, the oldest son. Well, it may be the only inn in Bethlehem, but I'm telling you, it's a four-star lodge. You can see it from all directions as you climb the road into Bethlehem. It, it stands atop the western hills like a stone fort. And when you get there, you look inside and you see an open courtyard, plenty of room for you and your servants, and down below, caves for your animals. Okay, I'm a bit of a carpenter myself, and I've built a score of rooms around the inside. Oh, the place looks so good. There was rarely a night that we didn't have some spice salesman or Samaritan or Galilean or Egyptian spend the night. And if you're coming through and you need a place to stay, we'll keep the oil light on for you. But I'm not here to advertise. I'm not here. I'm here to tell you about the week that changed our lives, where things were very different. It started off normal enough, except that we were very, very busy. The census, you know. The Romans, they don't have a census as often as you Americans do. Probably every 10 or 15 years. And they don't ask all those personal questions that you do. They basically want to know how many people live in each province, and how much wealth do you have? It was the emperor's way of assessing taxes. Well, I am proud to say that we Jews were no, we were no pushover province. 
We don't like taxes any more than you do. And what with the Roman tax and the temple tax, we were already giving over a third of our income away. Now they wanted to raise it even more. We didn't like standing in line and having foreigners say, where do you live? How much money do you have? How much property do you have? It was too much like slavery. We'd been slaves before. Didn't want to go back to that. Oh, Caesar knew that we hated it, but he didn't care. He left it up to the local kings to take care of. When this census was taken, it was about 5 B.C., as you measure time. The Caesar in Rome was Augustus. Our local king over us was Herod. Or as history calls him, Herod the Great. And I admit, if it comes to fighting wars or building buildings, he was great. But mainly, he was a great maniac. There was a lot we didn't know about him, but we knew he was crazy in the head. Oh, paranoid Herod. He thought everyone was trying to steal his throne or poison his food. And if you thought it was you, you might just as well start building your casket. And it didn't matter if you were family. You heard what he did to his wife, Miriamie. First, he killed her grandfather. Then, he killed her. Then, he killed their three sons. When word got back to Caesar, I heard that he just laughed. He said it would be better to be Herod's swine than to be his sons. After all, Herod claimed to be a Jew. He would have nothing to do with the pigs. But his sons were not so fortunate. Nor were all those babies around Bethlehem when those men from the east came and said that a king had been born in the area and he slaughtered the babies. But that's for another time. For now, Herod needed to get the orders out from Caesar about the census. So from the palace in Jerusalem came the word, everyone return to your ancestral homeland. Go back to the tribal roots the city, register, declare your property and your wealth. You have three months. You can imagine what this did for the hotel business. We were overrun with people. You see, everybody, all of Israel had roots in Judea. The Assyrians had wiped out the ten northern tribes, so everybody was heading back. Bethlehem was the city, the center of registration. So for three months, all of Samaria and Galilee was dumped into my lap. Where were people going to stay? Kim Hems Lodge. Oh, I had even turned a few old closets into income-producing rooms. We were busy. In retrospect, while the census was good for business, it was not so good for my marriage. No. You talk about your sick marriages? Ours was near death. About the only feeling between us was bad feeling. To hear her tell it, I just had no time for her. I told her I was busy. She said, you're too busy. I would just shake my head. 
According to her, I had turned our life into nothing but a pursuit for the almighty shekel. She said, if I, if I wasn't busy working around the inn, I was out gabbing with our guests and had no time for her. Ah, when I think about it, Malika was right. Malika. That's my wife's name. It's a pretty Hebrew name. It means queen. But she was no queen to me. She would nag, nag, nag. She was more like a witch. But I knew how to get her. At night, around the fire, I would call her Peg. I would say to her, Peg? And she knew what was coming, but she couldn't stop it. Peg? Peg, get some water for our guests. Peg. And sure enough, one of the guests would say, why do you call your wife Peg? And I would say, because it's short for Pegasus, who is an immortal horse. And she is an eternal nag. <laughs> oh, they would laugh. We would all laugh. Not so noble of me, I know. But it was true. It cut so I couldn't even stand the sound of her voice. Nagging at me. Pushing. I would, after finishing all my work, I would rather spend time with total strangers by a dying fire rather than go in and be with her. And if I tiptoed in the house, being very quiet, and slipped into bed, she would wake up and lay into me. But I learned. If I would go in the house and make lots of noise and call out her name, Malika, Malika, I want you. I want to kiss you. She would pretend to be asleep. <laughs> but she knew how to get me too. Also, around the fire, she would gather the ladies and she would say to them, a good husband is loving, caring, and sensitive. And then she would look at me and say, Kim has all but three of those qualities. <laughs> oh, they would laugh, but me not so much. As you can see, Malika and me were both very headstrong. Things had pretty much come to a stalemate with the emphasis on stale. Communication had died down to only what was necessary to keep the inn running. I have to admit, I was pessimistic. I began thinking about divorce. And it's a shame, really, because Malika was a good woman. Oh, the business, it was good for the inn, but not so good for my marriage. Until that one week that I'm here to tell you about, when things began to turn around. It started out like an ordinary week. In the morning, I would be busy working, replacing timbers. In the afternoon, was cooking cooking the meal for all of our guests, except for all of the interruptions where people would come banging on the door looking for a place to live, either because they had no relatives anymore in Bethlehem or all their relatives' places were filled up. Kim Ham's Lodge was no different. We hadn't had a vacancy in weeks. Jewish and Roman officials there every night filling up the place. I remember it was just before supper. 
the sun was just setting. And there was a banging on the door, loud and hard. And I remember thinking to myself how smart I was to have reinforced that door. I made my way across the courtyard and I opened the window to the door and looked out. And I groaned. It was that fat Levite from Jerusalem. I couldn't stand that man. Open this door. I'm sorry, sir. We have no room. I'll stay by the courtyard. Open this door. Sir, I'm very sorry. And he interrupted me and banged so hard on the door that I made a note to myself to reinforce the door one more time. Open this door or you'll pay double your taxes. Double my taxes? I'm a businessman. I opened the door. He pushed through and didn't even look at me, just threw silver down at my feet. Went to the fire in the middle of the courtyard with his servants following him. I was shaken. I took the servants and I led them down to the caves below to put the animals there. Honestly, the smell of the animals was much better than the smell of the Levite. I got them settled in there and was so glad for just the opportunity to not be near him. Well, then came supper. And we always serve a good meal at Kim Ham's Lodge. After the meal was served, Malika and I were cleaning up. We could do that without talking. I heard commotion out in the courtyard. And that Levite yelled, answer the door. I, I didn't even hear anything. I walked across the courtyard. I opened the window. I could see a taller figure standing there next to the taller figure was a smaller figure on a donkey leaning up against him. I cracked the door very, very carefully, knowing that we had plenty of hands inside. If these were robbers, we would be well protected. Yes, I said. Please, sir, may we have a room? It was a man. His voice was steady, but very weary, very tired. He said, we'll sleep by the courtyard if necessary. I said, I'm sorry, sir. We have no room. Oh, now I know, I know. Down through history, I've been portrayed as a ruthless heartless businessman, but that's not so. I didn't want to turn them away any more than you would have. It's not safe. Being turned away, it was dangerous out there with wild beasts and robbers. I scanned the courtyard again. I could see behind every canvas, every drape. Every space was full. The courtyard there were a few goats, but it was covered with human flesh. Tell them to go away. Ooh, it was that Levite. I'm sorry, sir. As you can see, we have no room. His head dropped. He turned pale. He said, sir, there's no room anywhere. 
my wife, she is about to have a baby. Please, don't you have anything? Send them away. That did it. I stepped out and I said to him, Sir, if you want, it's not the cleanest, but you can stay in our stable. And I led him down the hill, happy again to get away from that Levite. I led them through the stable. It seems the animals always seemed to make room. Took them to a corner where there was freshly laid hay. I said, I'll go and I'll get a blanket and some food. As I was walking up to the lodge, the stars were so bright that night, so bright. And I had that feeling in me that, that you get when you just know you're doing something right. I went in and I rustled up a hunk of bread and some cheese. And I heard Malika yell. She said, who is it? I said, it's just a couple needing a place to stay. She looks like she's about ready to drop a baby any day. Malika said, we have no room. I said, I know. I put them in the stable. It's at least warm. It's... And she said, the stable? The stable? You put them in the stable? Yes, I put them in the stable. Well. Malika was up. I have to say, she's a very caring woman. And a very good midwife. This woman, whoever she was, could have no better nurse than Malika. Well, off she went across the courtyard and I was following. That Levite was already snoring. I remember asking myself, why is it that the first people to follow sleep are always the ones that snore? Well, we went down to the stable. Malika went straight to the girl who we'd found out his name, her name was Mary. I went to the man and I could tell by his accent, he was a hick from the North Country, a Galilean. He said, my name is Joseph. Thank you for the food. I asked how long they'd been married. Was this their first child? He said, we've been married a year. And then very strangely, he said... This is Mary's first child. I thought that was odd, but it was my first clue that this was no ordinary couple. But how do I tell you what happened from there? Despite their age differences, Malika and Mary hit it off right away. And it's a misconception, you know, to think the baby was born that first night. The words in the story say that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Well, Malika and Mary made the most of those days. As for Joseph, turns out he and I had a lot in common. He was a joiner like me, a carpenter. He said, if I would allow him to stay in the stable, he would help me fix all the timbers. Well, I said, we carpenters need to stick together. So we did. We worked hard all week and replaced and repaired all the rotted timbers. There's something about working hard and sweating together that builds up trust. Maybe it's because you smell so bad and can still be next to each other. We took a break. And Joseph looked at me and he said, Kim, you're not going to believe this. 
But even though Mary and I are married, and she is expecting a child, she is still a virgin. The baby that is within her is not mine. It's God's. Well, I started to laugh and talk about what bizarre story young couples can come up with these days for these situations. But I saw the look on his face. And he was not indicating it was funny. Kim, I know exactly how you feel. I felt so betrayed. And if that wasn't bad enough, she's telling me this wild story. But an angel came to me in a dream and said, Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. The child was conceived of the Holy Spirit and will be a boy. And you are to call his name Joseph because he will save the people from their sins. What a wild story, huh? But by the end of the week, I started to believe it. It seems all week long, Joseph would thank me for letting them stay. But I should have been thanking Joseph and Mary because of what they were doing for Malika and me. Malika and Mary talked for hours and hours and hours about what I don't know. Malika didn't tell me I didn't ask. But I noticed that Malika was quieter, more at peace with herself, more at peace with God, even more at peace with me. As for Joseph, I couldn't help but notice how he treated Mary like a queen. If anyone had a reason to mistreat his wife, it would have been Joseph, but he didn't. The words of Malika rang in my mind. A good husband is loving, caring, and sensitive. And Kim has all but three of those qualities. Next to Joseph, she was right. She was right. Well, the night came. And Joseph was banging on a window saying, the baby's coming, the baby's coming. Again, Malika was up like a flash and running out, and she said to me, bring some warm water and some cloths. Well, I was all thumbs. By the time I got down there, she was already starting to bring the head out. She saw the look on my face. It was not good. She laughed and she said, get out of here. I was happy to get out of here. I went and I stood by the door of the cave with Joseph. In a little while we heard, it's a boy, it's a boy. Joseph looked at me like, what? We should be surprised. It's what the angel said. Yes, we weren't surprised. Malika cleaned up the baby and cut the umbilical cord and wrapped the little baby and put it in Mary's arms. Joseph went in to be with Mary. Malika came out and stood by me. She was so happy. So happy to have delivered that baby. Oh, Kim, isn't it wonderful? She was just 
beaming. I didn't know what to say. So I said nothing. I just stood there feeling like the floor of a filthy stable, piled high with bitterness and resentment and dirt. We stood side by side in silence. The night was starry, it was bright. It was blinking and I put my hand up on my eye and it was wet. Tears. I'm not a crying man. But all of a sudden, tears flowed like a, like a river rushing through a filthy stable, washing away my anger and my bitterness and my resentment. I reached over and I put my arm around Malika and I said I'm sorry and called her my queen. She looked up at me and her eyes were filled with tears of joy. She said, Kim, it's the baby. It's the baby. He's done this for us. And so he has. So he has. But I couldn't help but think about that baby. He was supposed to be special. He was supposed to save the world from their sins. But they had no room for him. The first breath he drew was the warm, moist breath of animals because people had no room for him. I thought about Herod, and I knew there would be no room for him in the palace. I thought about that Levite and knew there would be no room for him in the temple. How could he save the world if the world had no room for him? Malika looked up at me as if she could read my mind and she said, Kim, he saved our marriage. If he can do that, he can do anything. And so she was right. So she was right. Well, I'm Kim, and that's my story. And so I ask you, what will you do with Jesus? You know about him. Will you make room for him? He's waiting. Well, that is the question of the season, isn't it? Will you make room for him? And I hope that for all of us, as we go throughout the course of this week, which inevitably will be busy, inevitably, that we will take time to make room for Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the time that we get to gather as a church family. And Lord, in this beautiful and unique way today, hear a story that we have heard so many times before. I pray that we would all take the time to make room for Jesus this week. Thank you for our church. Thank you for our church family. Go with each and every person here this week, we pray. In your name, amen.